Today for Meet Your Neighbor, we're here at the Ice House Pond in Hopkinton with resident Joyce Michelle, who happens to be here on her birthday. Joyce selected the setting of this beautiful pond for our interview as she has a strong interest and connection to the earth, its history, its people, near and far. And I have a hunch there's so much to learn about Joyce, so let's have a listen. Hi Joyce, thank you for meeting with me today for Meet Your Neighbor. Uh, we are not inside, it's a beautiful day and it happens to be your birthday. Happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for meeting on your birthday and it's just beautiful. Uh, you and your surroundings here, we're in Hopkinton and we're at the Ice House Pond in Hopkinton and uh, this was your request uh, to have a place for a special place in Hopkinton that you selected you'd like to be uh, because you're connected to it in some way. Uh, why the Ice House, Ice House Pond? Well, it's a beautiful trail that uh, I often walk around. Um, it's got a bit of history with the uh, foundations of the old ice house around. It's got the lovely gazebo, which uh, a lot of people find to be a symbol of Hopkinton. You'll find it on the phone directories and so on. And then across the lovely pond, then there's uh, Golden Pond Assisted Living, which is where my mother lives. Ah, uh, uh -huh. so different uh, ways that this area uh, is special to you then. And you've discovered the trails and I know uh, in talking with you in advance, you mentioned a special interest in rock walls. Yeah, um, just in the past year or so, I've developed interest in the uh, stone walls of New England. I just happened to pick up a book um, from the local used and rare bookstore, Vintage Books. Uh huh, yeah. Um, I saw place. it there and appealed to, to me, and uh, I just learned that uh, stone walls are an important part of our local history that go back to our agricultural past. and, and uh, they each have their own personality and, and they're in so many places that just as I run or walk or drive around, it's something that, that catches my interest and I learn more about them, enjoy mm -hmm. them as, as part of nature and as also as a human-made artifact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, how did you get started with an interest in rock walls? Um, just when I when I saw the book. When you um, saw the book. Yeah, I think okay. the, the, uh -huh. the public library here had uh, hosted a talk on them, and unfortunately it wasn't a night I could go, but that put it in my mind that it was something I was interested uh -huh. in. Yeah. And uh, so I just happened to pick up the book. So we have them around here, you're saying? Oh, in vast, vast numbers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, they're li literally tens of thousands of miles worth of stone walls in New England. Wow. Almost anywhere anyone could imagine that they would go into the woods, they would encounter stone walls really by walking within a few, few feet. And once you start looking at a few of them, you begin to see what they might have been mm. um, and w how recently they've been altered and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, how, what time period do they typically take us to? Um, often well back into the 1800s, if not mm. earlier. Wow. Uh -huh. And then of course there are much, much more modern ones, including mm. the ones that adorn people's front yards and are beautifully and artistically laid in, in, in recent times. Mm -hmm. What uh, in particular is one piece of information you've learned about them that fascinates you a bit about rock walls uh, that you've learned about? Mm. I guess there's a sort of a distinction between rock walls that are thrown or ones that are uh, stacked or ones that are laid. Those are three different uh, distinctions. Thrown means they were just trying to get the walls out of their, f the, the stones out of their fields as quickly as possible uh -huh. so they could get back to their farming. Mm -hmm. So they just tossed them up in, in elongated hills that are not even built into walls. Those would be the oldest kind. Or if they had a bit more time and they wanted to get some more height, they would actually stack them. But again, they weren't trying for a finished look at all. Mm -hmm. But then by the time people had established homes and they wanted nice areas that would have a, a public and finished look, then they would have regular laid walls, which are the kinds that we might think of that have an even top surface, may even be mortared, mm -hmm. um, wow. and are, are done with some artistic intent. So mm -hmm. once you get to know that the, those sorts of terms, then you can kind of see the different stages and, and wow. what, with what intent they might have been made. Uh -huh. So that's fascinating. It's a bit like a history book in our backyards and woods here. Okay. Exactly. And, uh -huh. and like anything that you learn about, you start off and it all looks the same. And then as you learn more, it's the same as like learning about trees or insects or something. As you learn more, you see more levels of detail and wow. it gets more interesting. Uh -huh. oh, that is, it is very interesting and makes me want to get out on the trails now. 
Um, and it's obvious you have a great interest in history. And uh, for Meet Your Neighbor, I'm also curious a little bit about uh, your own and uh, how you came about uh, coming here. I know uh, you have family here. Um, did you meet your husband in Hopkinton? I actually met him in Israel. Oh, well, that's a little beyond, isn't it? <laughs> right. But after we had been together a while, he got a job in um, at EMC, uh -huh. and that's what yeah. brought us to this area. We uh, were delighted to leave the New York, New Jersey area, which oh. was way too um, population dense for us, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, get somewhere where he had an easy commute, mm -hmm. and was, um, where we had the woods in our backyard. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what brought us here in 1997. Oh, okay. And uh, you mentioned first meeting him in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, you were working there at the time? Yes, I had traveled there some, stayed there a bit to learn the language, ended up getting a job having to do with editing um, scientific materials in English, and happened to meet him in a computer room um, ah. at the place where he was going to graduate school. Uh huh. Uh, a great place to meet uh, mm -hmm. a future husband or yes. wife. Uh huh. And uh, so uh, meeting over in. Uh, another place on the earth and then coming back here to Hopkinton and this is where you have raised your family? Yes, since mm -hmm. the time that my three children were um, age five and down. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so you have three children and I know in talking with you before uh, one thing that you have done as family is to raise them in a homeschool environment. Okay. Right, we did that for about um, about eight or nine years. Uh huh. Wow. Well, that's a long time with three children, teaching them all at once at different ages and yeah. stages of learning. Uh huh. How, how did that go here in Hopkinton? Um, well, it's always it's always challenging to try to meet everybody's needs at once. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying I was completely successful in that regard, but um, Hopkinton was a very good, safe place to do it. We we weren't sitting at the proverbial kitchen table doing workbooks. Uh -huh. um, we got out a lot and we were a lot in the community. So uh -huh. I think a lot of my children's first learning experiences were that of going to local places like Colella's and the mm -hmm. post office and just seeing how the world worked and, and interacting with um, storekeepers and clerks and, and, and things like that. And, and it was a very nice way to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know you had mentioned there was an interesting beginning experience of learning at the post office. Yes, uh, one day, huh. and we were early in our, our homeschooling day, we just had to mail a letter and, and we were parked in the parking lot. And as we were coming out of the, um, out of the post office, we were speaking to a, um, a police officer who we knew slightly. As we were speaking to her, we saw another car in the parking lot back out mm -hmm. and smash right into oh. our, our tail light. Uh -huh. And um, the person then stopped their car and came out and peered around to see what damage they'd done and if, if in fact anyone was looking in there, mm. there was the, most of the family <laughs> looking right at them, uh -huh. along with the police officer, <laughs> so they rolled their eyes and shrugged uh -huh. and gave us their information. I'd never had any kind of car incident before, so I, but the, of course the local police officer told me exactly what information to get down. And then I looked at my kids and said, you know what, the car insur the insurance place is right across the street for homeschooling, we're going to learn about car insurance. <laughs> and believe it or not, they were really intrigued. They, they had seen the accident happen. They wanted to know, what do you do next? Mm -hmm. And so I went with my three kids right across the street to talk to the insurance agent. And um, actually, they, the kids were talking about it for a good long time. And so that, that was kind of emblematic of our homeschooling, which was that often we just went through the day and saw what interesting things would come up. And then we would deal with it and see what kind of life lessons we could learn in that point. And have it so tied to community. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as academic interests. Exactly. And the police do such a great job. That's uh, wonderful that that officer could be with you at that moment. Perfect timing. Uh, 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 so, um, and then homeschooling, uh, were you solitary in Hopkinton and uh, being a homeschooling parent? We knew a few other uh, local homeschooling mm -hmm. um, families and then also we interacted with some from other towns. Mm -hmm. um, and for a little while, um, well for a couple of years at my house we had a regular thing with a home, what we called homeschool Hebrew school, ah, where uh -huh. um, I helped provide the Jewish education for my own children and also some others um, who were part of the uh, Jewish community uh -huh. and homeschooled. Ah, so a little subset then right. as well. And how did that go through the years? That went well. Eventually we, we brought in a, a rabbi who had a higher level of knowledge than uh, I did. Okay. But uh -huh. uh, yeah, it was, it was a good start. 
And I know you mentioned in moving into Hopkinton, you were trying to keep some of the Hebrew t traditions going uh, for your family uh, to continue to learn from. And uh, so how did that go? It went very well. I thought we might have been a real peculiarity showing up here because we have enough of a level of observance that at times during the year we can be a little bit conspicuous. So for instance, in the fall, there's a harvest holiday called Sukkot, and the traditional thing is to build what's called a sukkah, which is a harvest hut, which we immediately built on our deck um, uh, within a couple of days of our arrival here. Mm -hmm. uh, we built it out of packing boxes, because those were the materials we had at hand. Um, and then we had the roofing of corn stalks, and then the, the, the seasonal vegetables mm -hmm. adorning it, and so on. And uh, we really didn't get too many odd looks. We got a couple of good, oddest questions. And then mm -hmm. people in the na neighborhood in subsequent years pitched in and helped us wow. and would come over and enjoy snacks with us as we would sit about in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, other holidays, for instance, uh, Hanukkah, which is, of course, near Christmas time. We would um, make hot latkes, you know, right, the potato pancakes, and right out of the frying pan, we'd put them on napkins, and the kids would run out in the cold and deliver them wow. to our neighbors. Uh -huh. um, we live in a condo right near the center of town mm -hmm. and uh, live very close, one next to another, and generally that's been a wonderful experience, mm -hmm. um, sharing different traditions and um, things with the neighbors. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds great. Uh, all around, uh, that neighbors have benefited from your moving in and likewise for your children and you to get to know them. And I know you mentioned Absolutely. you live with a number of elderly residents as well? I would say about half of the households in our neighborhood are, are older people mm -hmm. and they're, they're very, very nice with the kids. The kids have learned a lot from them. Mm -hmm. um, one of them has, has taught my son a lot about gardening. Uh, uh -huh. You mentioned a great snow story. Uh, yes, yes. Probably the time that the neighbors interact the most is in the winter when we get a uh, good snowstorm mm -hmm. and we all have to clear our cars out really quick so that the plow can get through and, and clear out the rest of the lot. And a good number of the people, it would be hard for them to clear off the cars, so then other people uh, pitch in. Mm -hmm. And before we know it, we have practically every family out in the, in the parking lot all clearing out one another's cars. Wow. And we get the little, little community spirit manifesting yeah. itself at that time of year. That sounds great. A uh, great thing to be a part of for your children as well as uh, all the rest of you, too. Mm -hmm. Nice way of feeling uh, unity of a community. Exactly. Hmm. Wow. Um, I was also curious, you had mentioned that as a family you have not watched television, typically. Uh, typically, no. We didn't arrive here with the TV. Uh -huh. We didn't have it. We haven't had one for most of the years we've been here. Mm -hmm. um, when my mother lived with us briefly, we had, but even she didn't watch it too much. And then after a while, we, we simply got rid of it. Wow. So you are without TV. For the most part, uh -huh. although, you know, these days, if you have a computer, you end up uh -huh. getting things that way. So, it, unfortunately, it does tend to creep in, and all of a sudden we find ourselves on our kitchen table that will have two or three laptop computers, and we're uh -huh. each yeah. watching a different uh -huh. thing. And I, all of a sudden, I begin to think that the, the, the TV mentality managed to sneak in through the back door. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. But it's, less, it's a less commercial, more individualized way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But still something one has to be on guard for. Yeah. Well, why on guard? Or what have you found to be of benefit in being without TV, which is very unusual in our society? Um, I think then there's a tendency to tune in more to the people around you and also um, to just what's going on in the here and now as opposed to what some external interest would like you to be seeing and reacting to, as far as, especially as far as commercials, but also as far as programming far as setting up whatever the ideals of the society are, as far as how people should look or what they should buy. Mm -hmm. I think there's there's a value in growing up apart from that, up, mm -hmm. up until one's of a critical age or, you know, where the children can think for themselves, is this what I want to be a part of or not? Mm -hmm. That it's not necessarily the assumptions one grows up with. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that does seem uh, important. Uh, does that mean you go without uh, a focus on entertainment? Uh, uh, what's going on in the world and the arts? I would say we, we're selective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, um, I think uh, as, parents, as parents we, we tend to have tastes towards classical music. And, um, we've developed a great love of ballet because our daughters did that for many uh, years. That's something I started not knowing anything about mm -hmm. but uh, had quite an education along the way. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, we'll go to movies when mm -hmm. there's something that appeals to us, but I think we, we really do pick and choose. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And your children now have moved on and uh, they're uh, in college? Uh, one just college, graduated right? college, uh -huh. one is in the middle of college, and one is in the middle of high school. Uh-huh, and they have their own interests. Uh, it sounds like from what we talked about earlier, they're all doing exciting things. Uh, already in the world out there. Yes, I think my daughters have, have uh, um, gotten my, my husband's love of computers, and oh, that's, okay. those are the uh -huh. interests in what they're pursuing, but from, from different aspects that are individual to their tastes as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then my son likes math and track and soccer. Uh -huh. so, okay. uh -huh. Well, that's exciting to see um, them go off in their own directions after all those years of uh, being teacher with them at home. Mm -hmm. And so now a little more quiet, maybe in terms of teaching at the home front, uh, but I understand you are still a teacher. Yes, <laughs> yes, I ended up formalizing it a little bit. This is my first year working for um, a math school in Framingham wow. um, as mm -hmm. a teacher. I worked there for a couple of years before that, um, working individually with families to try to place their children within, within our math program. Um, but this is my first year of classroom teaching, and on the whole, I've really enjoyed it. It's, uh -huh. it's been actually a um, good sort of challenge to uh, uh -huh. revive my math skills a bit, uh -huh. yeah. and also to interact with children with a broad variety of, of capabilities and try to keep it interesting, keep the morale up for the class wow. as a whole. Yeah. That's a lot of work, uh, and it sounds like you enjoy it uh, so far. Uh, do you uh, see a connection with your work in homeschooling? or? Anything in particular that um, you think? Yeah, I think so because I, I have a real enjoyment of seeing the variety of how different people's minds work. Mm -hmm. um, so many different ways of approaching material, whether it's math or, or humanities or people's interests. For instance, when we were homeschooling, um, for about two years, the only thing my son was interested in was his coin collection. <laughs> <laughs> and he was absolutely fanatical about that and not interested in many other things as when he was about six years old. So we used that as a basis for um, his reading, mm -hmm. for his mathematics, for wow. his interest in, in geography and um, science. We found everything related to coins somehow, whether either their value or their, what they were made of or what was written on them, um, so on. And uh, we were able to get in a good, good amount of his first grade homeschooling just by indulging his interest in, in uh, his coin collection and taking wow. that in different directions. Uh -huh. And I think that many interests are like that, that they mm -hmm. can expand throughout many um, disciplines. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an uh, interesting and important observation to have as a teacher, I think, to make learning meaningful that mm -hmm. way to what children are interested in. How about you for yourself as a child? Uh, did you have a particular passion uh, in seeing all these different areas you're interested in now? I'm just curious. Yeah, I guess I, I was interested in, in different things at, at different times. Um, Anything that stands out? Um, as a little kid, I was always drawing turtles because my brother had turtles, oh. and so everything was turtle this and turtle that. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, more substantial interests was um, eventually I, I got very interested in music and mm -hmm. played violin uh, through high school. Um, mm -hmm. Middle school, I was a hockey fan. Um, followed the uh, local team and had posters up on my wall. Not necessarily continuous with my interests these days, but mm -hmm. I guess it showed that I was, had very um, enthusiastic interests of different types, yeah. and that sort of enthusiasm, I think, has continued. Uh-huh, and, and that you were interested in uh, what the body could do as well as the mind. Uh, yes. In, in terms of uh, body being athletic, and I know that's something you're practicing now as well, in addition to all these other areas of interest uh, that you've been doing some running. We might see you running along the roads or trails of Hopkinton. Yes, a lot of people say that they see me because I guess I tend to run at the more populous times of day mm -hmm. and in the you know, places through the center of town and they say, oh, you must be a very serious runner because we always see you out. And I say, no, no, no. The serious runners were out at 5.30 a.m. and they had the sense okay. of running before the sun was high in the sky and before the traffic was out. I'm, not, I'm a less serious runner, but I, um, definitely I enjoy it. It was something that I actually couldn't do when I was, say, in high school. I didn't have the stamina for it, mm -hmm. um, something that I built up later. Mm -hmm. and when did you find the stamina? 
Um, a little bit in through my 20s, and then more recently when I changed my eating, I discovered that I had some, some food sensitivities, and that mm -hmm. when I eliminated certain foods, I had much more energy. Wow. And so, um, really, it's all mainly been the past five or six years, uh -huh. and it's a, it's a real kick to be doing something now at a level that I couldn't approach uh -huh. when I was a teenager. It makes me, makes me feel somewhat capable, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that does. Uh, empowering about aging. Um, yes. Well, and... Uh, is there anything in particular in terms of eating that you've learned about uh, that makes a particular difference for stamina and doing something later on in life you didn't think you'd be able to do when you were younger? Right. Well, I guess in my case, a lot of it has to do with um, decreasing any level of carbohydrates and dairy. It's, I have to eat a very restrictive diet in mm -hmm. order not to have things bother me, mm -hmm. which yeah. is not a lot of fun, but um, I guess I've learned the, the values of fruits and vegetables uh -huh. because those are the things that are pretty much guaranteed to agree with me. Oh, okay. And uh, there's a lot of good, at least at least there are things that are healthful eating that I can eat. And I try to look on, on the positive side of enjoying what I can have instead of um, moping about what I can't. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And it's made a big difference. So you're, you're running, are you racing? Occasionally, yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. Well, that, how do you like that? Um, I do like it. I unfortunately have to be really careful not to overdo it. I have this tendency to get a little too excited, a little too enthusiastic, <laughs> and wind up injured. I've done that a oh, bunch of times, yeah. so uh -huh. um, I have to just sort of have a little bit of self-control. <laughs> uh huh. Well, well, that is uh, exciting. There is a lot going on with you uh, as you're making another uh, birthday now, uh, beginning a new year uh, on the path of aging, which we all uh, do. Uh, from the moment we're born, but uh, it's really impressive all these different areas of life you've been taking on um, after as your children have been growing, you know, even the work of homeschooling I know is, uh, from what I understand, is very challenging and, and now at this point um, all these different areas and also you, uh, history of the land is inter interesting to you, but also Recently, you've been getting involved with history of the people as well, I understand, and you've taken on a particular character. Yes, uh, and character is absolutely the word, <laughs> because this is somebody who was um, a literary character, a fictional character created by the poet Longfellow in one of his works, mm -hmm. Tales of a Wayside Inn, which is tied to the nearby history, because that's the Wayside Inn of the book, is the one that's in Sudbury, just a few towns away. And so this was a, a person who was a character in the book, but Longfellow said that it was based on a real person in real life who he named as Isaac Edrahi. And so this person was also a real life flesh and blood person who lived in the Boston area and in many other parts of the country. And he was also a character in the sense of being a peculiar person. He was such a character. Mm. He dressed in costumes, exotic costumes, and he had many kinds of jobs and did a number of questionable things and attracted attention wherever he went and people liked to paint him and write about him and he also liked to advertise his doings in the newspapers so as a consequence of that um, because these days one can go online and search historical newspapers um, I when I looked him up I ended up finding a wealth of information that had not been gathered together before mm. and uh, so I, I feel like I, I have a sleuth's view of a person who was in his time somewhat well known, but in the interim has been largely forgotten, mm. who can now be, be traced out detective fashion as he went from city to city doing different things and advertising along the way. And I don't think he realized that he was leaving such a, a visible footprint mm. uh -huh, in the papers at the time. I don't think he would, it would have occurred to him that he could have been reconstructed uh -huh. um, more than a century and a half later. Well, it's. Uh it's really interesting that you have taken to his story in particular. Um, do you know one particular reason why you've been so drawn to him, especially in doing this sleuth work? Well, he's a very colorful character, and so he's, he's very appealing. He also, he was a person of his own time in that whatever was going on in history, uh. Uh -huh. He had an opinion. He made, did a lot of public lectures. Mm -hmm. Some of them were on the political parties at the time, and others were just on making his own pronouncements and things. Um, because of his costumes, he was a very visible person, and I guess I like the way he, he just had the capability of doing his own thing and following his interests, mm -hmm. even at a time when maybe other people were trying to, to fit in and settle mm -hmm. down, and he was moving around and, and being very inventive. The troubling thing was that he was in very much of a rogue and a scoundrel 
um, mm -hmm. which I suppose is also very entertaining to follow uh, because hopefully you would be hauled in by the police from uh, time to time on one thing or another. But may I say that, you know, with the exception of maybe the rogue <laughs> part, there is an interesting parallel to you in your own life and what you have taken on and are interested in doing and uh, regardless of what society is saying is important um, in following your interest and I, I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit about that as we end our interview which has flown by because there's so much going on in your life but uh, I, what you want to speak about uh, your own philosophy what you've been following and doing um, what you believe life is about hmm. well I guess in about one minute <laughs> yeah. well I suppose I'll just speak about what's important to me which is the, a balance in life. Um, I guess I balance the, my math with my interest in, in various kinds of humanities, history and literature, mm -hmm. and also um, balance between enjoying the present mm -hmm. and um, seeing the past, the local, local history. You know, if I walk down a trail, I'm thinking not just what am I doing here now, but what were the farmers doing mm -hmm. a century and a half ago, or what were um, the Native Americans doing long before that, um, so I guess what's valuable to me is to have a balance between seeing things on different levels or at different times. I, I find that tremendously enriching view of life, hmm. um, and I suppose I will leave it to other people whether they find that a value as well. Wow, well, great conclusion there to so much to talk about and really fascinating interview for our half hour together. Thank you so much, Joyce. And, you know, I noticed that the dragonflies are flying around you and the frog over there is singing happy birthday to you, <laughs> I believe. So very happy birthday to you. And thank you once again. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Hi, I'm Cheryl Peralt, host of the program Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV. This show introduces you to Hopkinton residents, the many interesting people who are our neighbors, and we invite them to share stories, experiences, insights, and observations from their lives. We'd like to hear who you think should be interviewed on our program. So if you know someone that Hopkinton should get to know more about, please email me and stay tuned for more episodes of Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV. HCAM TV showing movies? That's right. Dive in Drive is a new show on HCAM. Join Mike and I as we present some B movies. Movies that have piqued the two Mike's interest. And not to mention, they're also free. We'll give you some interesting tidbits about the cast and crews. And point out some of the reasons these are classic B films. So check out the HCAM TV website at HCAM.TV for movie days and showtimes.